Hello and welcome to this evening's ZSL Science and Conservation event. My name is Charlotte and I will be your host for tonight's event where we're going to be discussing the role of citizen science and conservation. We've got four fantastic speakers lined up for you this evening, but before we hear from them, I'd just like to run through a little bit of housekeeping. Now, the important thing about this evening's event is that we really welcome your questions. We would like to know what you would like to ask this evening's speakers. So with that in mind, we've got a couple of ways for you to submit your questions during tonight's event. Um, so I'm just going to bring up my PowerPoint here. And hopefully, it's always a little bit slow with changing the slides. Otherwise, I shall stick with, oh, here we go. There we are, right. So um, the two different ways that you can ask your questions this evening are either by going to pigeon, the Pigeonhole platform um, and typing in your question there. So if you go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931, that's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931, you'll be able to very simply submit your question uh, for our speakers. Now, if there's a particular speaker you'd like to ask a question to, then just make sure you pop their name in the question there so we know who you're directing it towards. Or you can ask a more open question and uh, we'll see who would like to answer that one for you. Um, if you can't access the Pigeonhole website for any reason, then you can send us an email instead. Just send that to scientific.events at zsl.org. That's scientific.events at zsl.org. Dot org. As well as welcoming your questions this evening, we would really like to hear your feedback at the end of the event. Now, I will be sharing this link at the end, um, so you don't need to scribble it down quite yet. But if you have just five minutes at the end of the event, please do go to surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event five and let us know what you thought. But as I mentioned, I will share that link again at the end of the event. So as I said before, we've got four fantastic speakers lined up for you tonight. We're going to hear from each of them. And then after each person has spoken, we'll take a, a few questions before we move on to the next. And uh, we'll have more questions at the end of the event too. Our very first speaker this evening is Joe Pecorelli from the Zoological Society of London. Joe is never too far from a paid pair of waders and he is a ZSL conservation project manage manager. He is an advocate for wildlife conservation that engages and benefits from the skills, energy and knowledge of citizen scientists. He's a board member of the Riverfly Partnership, professional eel measurer and developer of the Outfall Safari, a method for finding and reporting sources of pollution in urban rivers. Joe, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I should have my slides up now. That's it. Very good. I hope you can all hear and see me. Um, I get the privileged role of uh, really setting the scene for this evening's event, uh, which I'm very pleased to do. Um, uh, and so I'm going to dis describe what citizen science is, and also to use some examples from how we work with citizen scientists here at ZSL uh, to illustrate how we incorporate citizen science in our mission to achieve a world where wildlife thrives. So, in its broadest sense, um, citizen science is the process of involving volunteers in the gathering of scientific evidence and data. But as I think you're gonna see as the evening progresses, there are many different types of citizen science project. And I hope that we'll touch on a few of those as we go. And I think it's probably important- Joe, I'm really sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned that you've got some, some slides, but we can't see any of them at the moment. Oh. That's not great. I thought I was showing my screen. <laughs> Let me just try again. Sorry about that. No problem at all. Had to happen to someone and it was probably going to be me. Let's try again. Share screen. 
How's that now? Yep, I think it's just coming up now. There we go. Um, that's perfect. Thanks, Jay. Oh, I'm so. I'm so very sorry. Okay, so yeah. So where was I? So um, citizen science is um, the process of involving volunteers in um, uh, the gathering of conservation or scientific evidence. And I'm just, I've just got a slight problem here. I've got to just move my something over to the other screen. It works so well in the practice. Oh dear. Always the way, Joe, don't worry. Always the way, good, okay. So, yes. Um, and um, uh, what's so wonderful about um, working in citizen science in the UK is that there's a tremendous um, uh, history uh, and culture of working with citizen scientists. And this chart you can see shows a rise in the proliferation of different projects different citizen science projects that I suppose goes all the way back to um, sort of Gilbert White and his study of um, Selborne in the sort of 1800s. Uh, and in the modern, if we bring that up to the modern day, uh, the State of Nature report tells us that some 4.5 million wildlife observations are recorded annually uh, in the UK, which is an incredible resource an amount of effort uh, for us to, to work with as conservation NGOs. So I'm going to start with a couple of projects that, um, um, uh, are, that monitor populations of species. And of course, that's the foundation, isn't it, of conservation action. Um, we can't um, run a conservation project without knowing whether a species is increasing or decreasing or declining. Um, and the first project I want to mention is the London Hogwatch. So this is a multi-partner project across London, looking at hedgehog uh, strongholds and population trends, and uh, in order to improve uh, management of hedgehogs. And um, this is an interesting project because it involves um, uh, technology. So over a thousand camera traps have been deployed in this project. And that's something, the ability to gather evidence through using technology and the ability to communicate with communities of citizen scientists through new means of uh, technology has really underpinned that proliferation of citizen science projects. So a project that's probably is closer to my home, uh, to my heart, as I should say, uh, is um, uh, um, uh, our project on the critically endangered European eel. Uh, this has a 10-year history uh, of involving citizen scientists and um, uh, every year we have a hundred citizen scientists join us. It's um, a partnership project that involves some um, 22 different partners and that's another key point um, of um, citizen science projects. It's their ability to um, uh, bring in stakeholders, uh, bring stakeholders along together around a conservation priority. So in the case of the eel, um, we work in partnership with the um, Environment Agency who own the eel management plan for the region and all the data that feeds into the Citizen Science Project um, um, brings works in, in with that um, uh, eel management plan plan and bring stakeholders on board together to support that eel management plan. The next project I want to mention uh, when, I, when I calm down after my technological issues, I've got, I've got my slides on the wrong screen here, so it's a bit difficult to, uh, to look at you, but um, the next project I want to mention uh, is the, our Garden Wildlife Health Project. Um, so obviously um, uh, wildlife health is a, a key focus area for ZSL, and this is a flagship project of ours, which involves four different um, NGOs, which I hope you can see on your screen now. And I'm not going to mention too much about this because Kate uh, Risley is, is soon to follow me and she'll be talking uh, in great de depth about the Garden Wildlife Health Project. So I'm going to come back to home turf. And for me, that's freshwater conservation and in particular rivers. And um, citizen science lends itself very well um, to informing river management and uh, river conservation. And that's because 
uh, river catchments uh, are large and citizen science is very good at gathering, gathering data across large geographical areas in a very cost effective way. Uh, river catchments cross many boundaries, so local authorities, uh, different NGOs involved, and again, thinking about that eel uh, monitoring project, citizen science can be a means by which you can coalesce different stakeholders around a conservation um, uh, project or conservation action. And also for rivers, um, uh, the way they are regulated means that well, they are well, very well suited to citizen science. And what I mean by that is uh, they are regulated through the Water Framework Directive, huge piece of legislation to, to, to bring our surface waters up to a, 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 a good health in the UK. And at the heart of that piece of legislation is community action and citizen science can be used to guide uh, that um, community action. And one project that we're heavily involved in is the River Flying Monitoring Initiative. This is uh, a citizen science project that's active on over 80 catchments, about 2,000 volunteers involved across the UK in this. And it's essentially a, a, um, a simple, it's a citizen science method for using the invertebrates in a river to derive a score of the river health. Um, it's a standard method. Um, and it's for detecting pollution, essentially. So when a score drops below a certain level, then a pollution event has occurred in a river. And the key here is about bringing citizen scientists along to work synergistically with the regulator. So the, the citizen scientists on the ground gather the evidence, pass it to the regulator to bring polluters to account. Um, Coming from our work with the Riverfly Monitoring Initiative, so we manage the London hub for the Riverfly Monitoring Initiative, along with the partners you saw on the slides. Um, one of the problems we've noticed for uh, urban rivers and particularly rivers in London is the problem of misconnections. So we devised a citizen science methodology for finding, reporting um, and reporting those uh, uh, misconnections, so pollution from outfalls. Again, I don't want to talk too much about this because Hannah Joyce is going to follow us on, the, on this event uh, and talk about the impact of the outfall safari. But for us, it's bringing citizen scientists along with a wider strategy to tackle the issue of pollution from outfalls in rivers in London. So just to bring this to a close, um, you know, we've, we're facing um, quite some crisis, uh, our wildlife is, and uh, we know uh, the challenges ahead and we need to scale up our ambition. There's a good pathway laid out in the 25 year plan, talking about leaving the environment in a better state for future generations, but that's gonna require monitoring and it's gonna require us to work more with that wonderful resource, those 4.5 million observations annually more and better, I'd say, to better in, for a better impact. And it's going to require us to work uh, alongside statutory bodies. And we, we very much hope that, uh, or it's important to state, that citizen science is not to replace the role of statutory monitoring, but needs to augment uh, statutory monitoring. So just to finish up with, these are a few of the questions that keep me awake at night. These are the few of the questions that I'm looking forward to uh, tackling or to, to, to getting to grips with as this event progresses? How do we engage more uh, people in citizen science? How do we achieve greater impact from citizen science? And how do we increase the engagement of underrepresented communities in citizen science? And uh, it is a problem that some, some communities aren't engaging. And I hope this is an issue that we can discuss with Sarah, who's coming on um, at the end uh, of this, this evening's event. So these are the wonderful people that support all the projects I've mentioned. Um, I'd also like to, of course, thank our citizen scientists. There's always room for more. So if you follow the link the, on the Get Involved pages of uh, ZSL's website, please do sign up. And once we get through this horrible period of COVID, uh, we look forward very much to welcome you as, uh, as, as a citizen scientist on one of our projects. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Joe. A quick plug there for um, 
for getting involved with some of ZSL's very own citizen science projects. I'm just going to quickly share my screen once more to remind everyone of uh, how you can submit your questions for um, Joe and our other speakers this evening. Don't forget you can go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931 that's 1931 uh, to submit your questions there or you can send us an email to scientific.events at zsl.org so thanks so much for um that that introduction to this evening's event joe um, we have had a question through already on pigeonhole oh and actually there's a couple there now um, the first question, though, to, to be asked this evening was about the water framework directive that you, you measured and sort of what the impact of Brexit has, has been on that. Um, I wondered if you could just comment on that. Wow, that's a heavy duty question to get going with, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, thankfully, I mean, what, um, um, the water framework directive put ecology and wildlife at the heart of um, um, uh, the UK's strategy for managing surface water. So I'm pleased to say, along with all the other European legislation, it was brought over and is now in, in um, um, uh, certainly English uh, law. Um, I believe it's undergoing some review or it will do the plan is to review it, um, but I hope it remains pretty much intact. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, another question, hopefully a slightly simpler one to answer. And I suspect it's because of all um, of the, the technical issues we had at the, the very start that you were probably thrown a bit. But uh, someone has just asked for, for you to re-clarify what we mean by citizen science. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I failed at the, at the outset. I forgot Don't to worry. share to press the sharing button. Um, so citizen science uh, in its broadest sense is the process of involving volunteers in gathering scientific evidence and data. Um, that's really what I meant to say at the outset, but I was thrown by my lack of slides. Sorry about that. So unfair, isn't it, Joe? Don't worry. Thank you so much for clearing that one up. Um, we've got time, I think, to um, squeeze in one more question we've got a, a few here and I'm sure we'll manage to to cover them as as we go along through the evening um one thing I didn't mention about pigeonhole for um any of you who have sub submitting questions is you can also upvote other people's questions and we will be looking to prioritize the questions with the most votes as we go through the evening so the most popular question at the moment Joe, is do you think schools could do better um uh, could could be a better could be better used as a platform to engage a more diverse audience in citizen science. I don't know if you've got much um, experience of involving school school audiences yourself in citizen science projects. Um, we generally have to, ha haven't, to be honest with you. I mean, we really value out, outreaching to, to schools. And in fact, with yourself, Charlotte, we were talking about eels from the riverbank a few, uh, a, a few years ago. Um, but they do represent an important resource. And there was a wonderful project that was that, that ran for five years called the Opal Project, which devised a number of very exciting ways of engaging school aged um, uh, children in citizen science. Uh, it, to date, it's something that we've not particularly done, to be honest with you. Mm. Well, it might be um, perhaps something that comes up uh, later on as an example with some of the other speakers. But thank you so much, um, Joe, for, for that. We will come back to you later with, with more questions. But for now, we're going to move on to our next speaker this evening, who is Kate Risley, uh, who until recently was working at the British Trust for Ornithology. Kate spent 16 years working for the BTO, running large scale citizen science projects. First, the Breeding Bird Survey, survey which charts national bird population trends, and then the BTO Garden Bird Watch, which now receives weekly garden bird records from over 20,000 participants. She keeps a record of her own garden birds, records the moths she traps in her garden, and has even carried out an underwater wildlife survey. Kate believes it's important that records collected by volunteers should be used to make a difference for wildlife. Kate, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, I'm now 
been made very nervous by Joe's issues with his screen. So hopefully this will work. Um, so I think I'm sharing my screen now. So for the avoidance of any doubts. So I hope that somebody will jump in and tell me if I'm not. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for that introduction. Um, my name's Kate Risley. Up until recently, I worked for the British Trust for Ornithology. And the title of my talk is The Impacts of Citizen Science on Policies, People and Wildlife. But obviously, that is an absolutely huge subject. And there's no way that we could cover, um, give that any kind of, um, do any kind of justice in this talk. So um, I'm just going to, um, oh dear. Here we go. Excuse me a minute. I'm just trying to move some things around on my screen so I can actually see what I'm doing. There we go. So yeah, what I'm going to um, cover today is not the entirety of citizen science and the impacts of citizen science on the world at large, but I'm going to focus on um, large scale national volunteer wildlife monitoring projects. And I'm talking about the very large scale projects um, because obviously they're the ones that I've been involved with throughout my career. Um, as mentioned earlier, I, um, up until recently, I was running the BTO Garden Bird Watch Survey, which is a very large scale um, garden bird survey. And before then I was running the Breeding Bird Survey, which is where we get our national bird population trends from. And um, just to mention that, you know, just to really differentiate these from um, other kinds of citizen science projects. So there are um, projects like some of the ones that Joe was mentioning earlier that um, really bring people on the ground um, together and link them to the outputs of um, the monitoring that they're doing so they can really see the results. But for these very large scale data collection um, surveys, that's not always the case. So the kind of impacts and uh, motivations that I'm talking about here might not apply to all other kinds of citizen science. Um, but the kind of things I'm really talking about today are these kinds of different surveys. So we've got um, a very long pedigree, as Joe mentioned, in this country of um, amateur monitoring of wildlife. And a lot of these organizations, a lot of these surveys have been running for decades. Um, some of the surveys, the bird surveys that the BTO runs have been running for 70, 80 years. So this is a huge amount of monitoring data. Uh, we found out so much about what's happening in the wild, to the wildlife in our country. Um, and the number of people who've taken part in these surveys probably runs into the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of individual people who've um, given up their time and their expertise to collect this information. And they obviously want to know what the point of it is. Um, how is this information used? I mean, it is really important to know what's happening um, and, to, um, and to understand what wildlife we have, um, what the distributions are of our um, wildlife populations and the trends. So what's happening, um, whether the numbers are going up or down. But if we identify a decline, um, who then takes that data and does something about it? Um, and this is a question which um, I've been asked quite a lot throughout my time organizing surveys. And it's a really important one um, to understand because not everyone understands really the process that this information goes through. So if we're talking about national scale surveys, um, obviously the who does something about it is generally the government. Um, in this country, um, you'd be talking about DEFRA um, and the statutory nature conservation country agencies. Um, but obviously the way that government operations work um, is very much constrained by what the legislation is um, and um, there are procedures that have to be followed and it isn't the case that um, government policy can be very agile. So there have to be mechanisms which allow the citizen science data that are collected um, by volunteers to feed in to decisions that are made on the ground. And one example of this that I'm going to talk about, which I know um, quite well, there are quite a few others, is the um, 
system of red and amber listed birds of conservation concern. So I think everyone's probably heard of this, um, but how it works is that you have a species um, that is in decline. Here we have turtle dove. But the only way we know that there's a decline is because people have gone out and they've done standardized surveys, in this case, breeding bird surveys, and they've counted turtle doves and they've recorded those numbers and they've sent those numbers into a citizen science project. Um, and what happens with the breeding bird survey is that every year the um, population trends are published. Um, and then every few years, a group of organizations and stakeholders comes together and updates the lists of red and amber listed birds of conservation concern. And declines are not the only reasons why a species might be a conservation concern. Um, it is one, you know, there are others such as um, the UK might hold a um, significant proportion of the international population, but generally it's the birds that are declining. And I did mention that um, I, up until recently I worked for BTO um, and now I actually work for Natural England and it's been really interesting um, and, you know, it's really opened my eyes actually to see how much these designations in particular, you know, for example, the birds of conservation concern, the red and amber list, are actually used on a day-to-day -day basis for decision making. Um, and obviously I think maybe the people who are um, making these decisions within government um, aren't always sort of, don't always have in the front of their minds where this information comes from. Um, all they need to know is that this is a red listed bird or this is an amber listed bird. Um, but it's been great for me to see um, the sort of full circle, if you like, because obviously I was kind of at the other end for quite a long time, um, you know, dealing with um, the volunteer data and the citizen scientists and collecting that information. So it's been really great to see how it's been used. So um, the kinds of things where government operations, where citizen science really feeds in um, are, I mean, there's many different ways. Um, obviously, Joe mentioned um, the Water Framework Directive and rivers um, using citizen science. Um, some other areas are obviously citizen science data in terms of particular um, species being present at particular sites. Um, can be very important for things like site protection. And very often these records of particular species would have been collected by volunteers um, for a survey. That's how we know that something is present. Um, and just so that I'm not mentioning, talking about birds all the time, um, I'm just going to mention um, marine conservation zones and how um, some marine conservation zones in some cases um, are help the designation is helped by data collected by volunteer divers, for example. So that's how um, citizen science data can be used in the management of fisheries. Um, agriculture is obviously an area where um, the red and amber lists, um, for example, of birds of conservation concern um, are used um, when designing agri-environment schemes. And the, um, and in development, obviously in terms of um, particularly protected sites. Um, sites might have additional levels of protection depending on what species are present. Um, but something else, uh, another mechanism to do with protected sites that perhaps people aren't always aware of is the concept of thresholds. So um, for example, a site might have an additional level of protection if it holds more than a certain percentage of the national population of that species. Um, and where this really, um, comes into play quite a lot, might be in estuaries, when it comes to port developments, that kind of thing. Um, really have to take into account, for example, the populations of wintering waders and water birds um, and how important the site is for those populations. Um, and the reason why I've got a picture of a nightingale here is that a lot of you might have heard um, a few years ago of the case of Lodge Hill, which um, was a planned housing development and then the site received protection because the, um, it held um, more than a certain threshold of the UK's breeding nightingales. And the reason why I'm mentioning these thresholds is that you can't tell whether a site has more than a certain percentage of the national population unless you know what the national population is. And those national population estimates are generally derived from citizen science volunteer data. So it's kind of a, a roundabout route really, but um, it's actually, if we didn't have that citizen science data, 
um, a lot of these um, measures of site protection um, wouldn't, you know, we just wouldn't know um, exactly how important each site was because we wouldn't be able to put them in context of the national population. So um, that's one um, very important way that citizen science data are used nationally. Um, I will just quickly mention that obviously if you're talking about national operations, you're generally talking about government, but there are other organisations, other non-governmental organisations, you know, such as the RSPB, that do um, base their policy on um, population trends or information we get from citizen science data, um, for example, in managing their nature reserves to turn around um, the, the fortunes of um, endangered species. So um, that all seems very clear. And I've kind of jumped from one step, which is understanding what's happening with our wildlife to the step of um, putting, like fixing it and saying, well, these are the actions that we have to take to help conserve these wildlife. But another really important step that kind of comes in the middle is understanding what's causing the change. So we say, that a species is in decline. Um, and it's very easy to just jump straight into a solution. So for example, we might look at house martins and say house martins are in decline. Let's put up lots of house martin nests to help with, um, to help their populations. But that won't make any difference to the decline if, it, if they're not suffering from a lack of nesting sites. For example, it might be that the causes of their decline are to do with their wintering grounds. Um, at other times of year and nothing to do with what's happening in this country at all. Um, obviously, in a lot of cases, these kind of impacts are cumulative, so you can't always say um, this is the problem and not this, but it's really important to understand things like um, drivers of change of amphibians and reptiles, which is a project that um, the BCO is getting involved with recently. And as Joe mentioned earlier, um, the Garden Wildlife Health Project, which is why there's a very unpleasant, um, poorly looking great sit in the center of your screen right now, um, is about understanding the effects of disease on wildlife populations. Um, and citizen science data um, really has a big part to play in these um, understanding why changes are happening. And we, there's no point starting any kind of conservation action until we really know um, why it's happening and what the important point is. I just want to touch here very briefly on um, something which isn't always fully appreciated, but it's the fact that if it wasn't for these long-term citizen science programs, we wouldn't really know as well as we do now about um, the widespread declines that um, are you know being experienced in some wildlife populations. So it seems like everyone knows that um, there's declines in hedgehogs or swifts or pollinators, for example. And a lot of people take action because they want to help save wildlife. Um, and those actions that people might take, which might be, for example, making their garden wildlife friendly, um, planting for pollinators, making holes in their um, fences for hedgehogs, putting up a swift nesting box. Um, all of these actions might make a difference um, to these populations, um, but it is, we wouldn't know that there was a problem and people wouldn't have been inspired to take those actions if we didn't, um, if it not been for the efforts of the citizen science programs in the first place. And it's kind of forgotten about. And then another sort of individual way that people can take action is not just by, for example, making their garden wildlife friendly, um, but just going back to all those um, kind of government frameworks that I talked about earlier. Um, there wouldn't be these laws in place and there wouldn't be these frameworks if it were not for people taking action and pressing the government to um, take these things into account. So, um, and the awareness that triggers people to put this pressure on the government often comes from the knowledge we have from citizen science. And that's possibly a bit tenuous, um, but I think it's actually really important not to forget where all this awareness came from. So that I think is, um, I have, I'm actually doing two talks in one. So that was, um, that was 
partly what I was going to talk about, but I was also going to move on for the last five minutes to talk about the project, Slight Change of Tack, um, which is a, a question that was asked by um, Phoebe Maund, who did a research, um, research study on why people take part in these large scale projects. And this was carried out under the Garden Wildlife Health um, Partnership Scheme, which um, as Joe mentioned earlier, is a partnership between ZSL, BTO, RSPB and Frog Life. And it's about people recording um, any kind of signs of disease or sickness that they see in their garden wildlife. And what, um, what's kind of a feature of this, which is a feature of many large scale population um, or sort of large scale citizen science schemes is that you don't get any kind of community aspect to it really. Um, you don't get to meet up with other people and um, you know, sample uh, river wildlife um, or do any of those kind of things which hands-on citizen science projects might have. You're just going to your computer and you're sending in a notification um, and sending in a record. Um, and so really the question was asked, you know, what do people get out of it? What motivates them to take part um, in these projects and in particular garden wildlife health? And the sort of main drivers for motivating people to get to take part, which was um, you know, nicely confirmed what we, what we thought we knew, was that it was about partly valuing a desire for knowledge, um, just people really understanding and recognizing that it's important to know. Um, you know it's really important for, for the public in general to participate, to inform somebody if they see something of interest and to add to our knowledge as a society in general. And people really um, understood the value of that. And also, obviously, they hoped that it would protect, help to protect the wildlife. By taking that action, by taking part in that survey, they wanted to make a difference for wildlife. And here's a nice little quote um, with a sort of pretty unpleasant picture of um, a sick, Green Finch, um, but the quote is, it is important for us to be aware of possible disease outbreaks and to prevent them where we can. Um, and this is why people were taking part in these projects because they wanted to actually um, to make a difference. And this is a graph um, just very quickly at the end here from that paper um, led by Phoebe Mond. And it is really showing that safeguarding wildlife, conserving and safeguarding welfare is really people's top um, reasons for taking part in the Garden Wildlife Health Project, um, you know, and then adding to the next sort of st steps down, we're about adding to knowledge, adding to their own knowledge and adding to our collective knowledge. Um, so if we want to um, kind of continue these large scale citizen science schemes in the future, um, which as I said, we've just got a great tradition in this country of people taking part. Um, we just have to really make sure that um, we're using the data appropriately for the reasons that people um, feel like it should be used. So just going to end there um, with a few thanks and um, in particular to um, sort of everyone who was involved in that paper on volunteer motivations and my colleagues at BTO and the Garden Wildlife Health team um, and as well as those all wildlife survey volunteers. Thank you very much. Thanks very much Kate that was really interesting um, and we've had lots of questions mm -hmm. coming through as well from uh, viewers so I'm going to try and tackle a, a couple of those now before we hear from our next speaker uh, because the most the most popular question by a long shot um, is about the accuracy of citizen science data um, in particular is there concern about the accuracy of the data from large scale citizen science projects, perhaps uh, ones such as the, the BTO um, Garden um, Birdwatch. I forget, I forget the title of the, the project, mm. but you mentioned 20,000 people in, involved in, in that. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with it and ensure that the, the results you're getting are accurate? Yeah, so that's a really, um, that's a really good question. I will, just clarify um, some 
very confusing survey names. So we do have the BTO's Garden Bird Watch, which is a weekly year round survey, not to be confused with the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch, which is the one day a year um, kind of over a weekend one that's just happened. So obviously um, a lot of people are very familiar with. And um, I would say that um, the, there are different standardizations for different kinds of bird surveys, for example. So um, at the one end, you've got um, things like maybe um, casual recording, which is bird track, which is maybe big garden bird watch. Um, and it's sort of useful data, but it's not very standardized. And I think that probably this question is coming from people who don't, who are seeing these kind of um, surveys and I think, well, they're not very standardized. Um, and that's true. And there's lots of things you can get from them, but you definitely can't get um, trends. You can't get confident trends from that kind of information because there isn't any standardization. So that's co quite correct. I would say that when we're talking about bird trends um, that are used, for example, in the red and lists um, and are derived from the breeding bird survey, these are very standardized surveys where um, very experienced um, bird watchers go to a particular site, they walk the same route, they do it every year, they survey in a very standardized way and they do it on a very large scale as well. So we've got several thousand people who take part in the breeding bird survey so even if like one survey might be off a little bit, um, overall, over all thousands of people and over thousands of um, survey sites that are monitored, we're really confident that we're picking up um, those large scale changes. So yes, for common species, we're very confident in our standardized data. Um, there are lots of, there's some, lots of great information that we can get from the less standardized surveys but those, that information wouldn't be population trends. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a lot of it comes down to uh, repetition, the scale of, of the, the project as, as well, and, and really importantly, training as well, and, and ensuring you, you've got people who, who know, know what they're doing. Yeah, so for example, in, in the Breeding Bird Survey, um, we do run training courses and... Um, we do advertise it as this is a survey for people who can go out into a patch of countryside and recognize by sight or by sound any birds that they're likely to encounter. So yeah, these are pretty highly skilled volunteers who are doing those particular um, surveys and also extremely talented um, and knowledgeable statisticians um, whose work I couldn't possibly um, understand in any way who can interpret the data. Fantastic, thank you. And um, we've got another question as well, um, which asks, how is citizen science different to mainstream volunteering? Is it a bit of a, a blurry line or, or, or is it easy to be able to tell the difference between the two? So citizen science is a form, in this sense, it's a form of volunteering. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a type of volunteering where you are giving... Um, where you're collecting data as your volunteer activity and that data is then used for science so it's a category of volunteering Fantastic. Um, i would say i mean other people are also um you know know a lot about more of the kind of theory of citizen science than i do but there's a real range of um involvement of the citizen scientists in the science so you've got some um citizen science surveys where the volunteers um, they collect the data, but they don't really do anything else with it, all the way along to the other end of the scale, where essentially the volunteers are doing the science um, and are just being enabled by maybe an organisation. So, yeah, there's a real range. Sounds like it. Great. Well, we're going to um, leave it there, Kate. But as with, with Joe, we will bring you back later on for, for more questions. Thank you ever so much. Um, our next speaker this evening is Dr. Hannah Joyce uh, from the River Restoration Centre. Hannah is a fluvial geomorphologist interested in the dynamic interactions between flow, channel morphology and sediment transport to support process-based river management and restoration. 
Hannah works at the River Restoration Centre based at Cranfield University, providing technical advice and guidance to support the creation of naturally fun functioning river systems valued by people. Recently, Hannah has been researching the role of citizen science within river restoration projects and how we can measure the impacts of citizen science. Hannah, thank you very much for being part of our panel this evening. I hope you can all see my screen. So thank you very much um, for inviting me today. So a big thank you to Joe, Charlotte, um, Ellie and the Zoological Society of London team for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, this evening and I'm going to be talking about the measuring the impacts of citizen science project. Now this is an EU Horizon 2020 funded project which involves working with researchers both in the UK and overseas in Europe to develop tools and techniques to, to measure the impacts of, of citizen science. And I'm going to be talking about um, the impacts of the Outfall Safari citizen science project. So as Joe mentioned in his talk, Outfall Safari is a great um, citizen science initiative um, and it involves volunteers and citizen scientists um, going out and surveying their rivers and spotting and recording um, polluting surface water outfalls um, to help tackle kind of the is issues of misconnections in urban rivers. So I'd like to talk, start my talk by asking a question, is citizen science an important mechanism to inform and support our society, governance, the economy, the environment, science and technology? Well, yes, we're all gathered here today to talk about what citizen science adds, who is taking part and what are the impacts. So citizen science benefits a wide sphere of people, not just those involved, citizen scientists, but also scientists, the wider community and wider scientific community and the project managers, as well as other, other um, organisations. And citizen science has multiple impacts across different three themes. Um, for example, in Outfall Safari um, project, it can impact the environment by collecting data to help inform and tackle these um, misconnecting polluting outfalls. Citizen science can help to um, society by engaging and educating society. It can help impact our economy by making us more efficient in identifying pollution in our rivers, um, but also streamlining the process about how we um, manage them and um, tackle them as well as governance um, and, and kind of the data that citizens can collect can actually be used to help drive um, policy and legislation to improve the management of our river systems. And finally, citizen science can impact science and technology to support kind of the development of new technologies such as apps um, for recording these pollution hotspots. However, at the moment, there is no real methodology or the tools to measure these multiple different impacts across citizen science projects. And as part of the MIX project, we have reviewed over 70 publications that measure citizen science impact. And out of all of these papers, very few studies focusing on measuring the multiple impacts that citizen science can provide. And I think it was only about two of the publications captured all different themes of society, economy, governance, technology and the environment that citizen science can impact. And the measuring impacts of citizen science project, the MIX project aims to fill these gaps by developing tools and metrics for measuring the multiple impacts of science, of citizen science. And the idea is that these tools and metrics can be applied to any citizen science project. So why should we measure the impact of citizen science and why should we measure the impact of Outfall Safari? Well, having a measurement of um, a citizen science impact allows us to create an evidence base of the benefits that that citizen science project can provide. It provides us data on the project's spheres of influence. It's useful for supporting future project funding bids um, and supporting um, the funding behind organizing and the management of citizen science projects. It can help make citizen science more efficient and more effective. It can also spread the use of citizen science more widely and increases our knowledges of citizen science impact. So how do you go about measuring impact? Well, firstly, we need to understand the short and long-term impacts of a project and how they're achieved. And we call this creating an impact journey. And this is based on um, the social science kind of theory of change logic. And the theory of change or an impact journey 
is essentially a hypothesis of how we think change occurs as a result of our citizen science activities. So understanding impact journeys for citizen science projects involves gathering the perspectives of impact from both the citizen scientists involved in the project, um, but also the project managers through workshops or questionnaires. And once we've kind of understood the impacts and the impact journey um, related to that project, we can begin to build together how they are achieved um, and develop indicators and a monitoring and evaluation plan to measure and achieve impact. So as part of the, the, the MIX project, we've been running workshops with um, Outfall Safari citizen scientists. We've had face-to-face -face and online workshops where we've been getting the volunteers to brainstorm and document their ideas and what they think are the impacts of the, the data they've collected um, and how they contribute to wider impacts. And this is just a screenshot. Um, we're using virtual post-it notes and it shows all the different thoughts that are going on and the different perspectives of different people. And it's been great to have all the citizen scientists involved. So I'd just like to say thank you um, for everyone that's come along and is taking part in these workshops. So one of the first things we did in the workshop was to ask citizens their motivations. And there are lots of different motivations for being involved in citizen science and out for safari. Some were focused around understanding the environment and improving rivers um, and tackling those pollution incidents. And other, others are interested from more social side, learning and making new friends. So having this understanding of the background as to why we get citizen scientists involved is a really important for how we make our citizen science projects more efficient and um, get more people involved. We then ask the citizens um, what the short and long term impacts of Outfall Safari um, and the data they collected um, impacted. And there was a really a range of different impacts identified by the citizen scientists. And this slide is going to get very busy soon. So firstly, around the environment theme, um, citizen scientists really kind of identify key, key impacts um, as being an improvement to our water quality by firstly identifying these pollution um, hotspots um, and, then present, and then helping to tackle it. Uh, citizens also highlighted impacts related to society and the sharing of information, increased kind of education and learning but also empowerment of the local groups for yeah, being able to monitor kind of independently issues um, related to rivers near where they live. Citizen scientists also identify impacts related to the economy um, and how it can, by them collecting the data, can help to um, create cost savings and create this baseline of data um, so we can monitor going forward um, our river systems. And governance was a real topic of interest related to how hopefully this data the citizens have collected can lead to long term um, better management and legislation or fines um, related to pollution from these outfalls associated with kind of misconnections in, in people's houses. And finally, around the science and kind of technology theme. Um, there was less discussion around this, but citizens really kind of highlighted how using the app and how um, the data they can let collect can help inform new technologies to record and monitor these um, different um, impacts. So this slide really shows the diverse multiple different short and long term impacts Outfall Safari has on our environment, our economy, uh, the wider society, governance and science and technology. We then in these workshops got the citizens to rate the top three impacts that were most important to them. Um, and these were really related to the environment theme. Um, related to um, improving the biodiversity, improving the water quality and, and having a greater awareness um, of pollution in society. But also another theme that was really important to the citizen scientists and seen as a long term impact um, at, with their involvement was related to governance and help hoping that the data they've collected will contribute to better management um, and hopefully longer term legislation. So to achieve the impacts of Outfall Safari, um, strategies really need to be put in place um, so we can get to those impacts. So we asked citizen scientists what strategies were needed from their activities to achieve the impacts they'd identified. And they identified really three key points. Firstly, about communication channels and about the transparency and flow of data that they've collected. Um, for example, so the citizen scientists in Outfall Safari will identify these polluting surface water outfalls. 
Um, and the hope is that this then gets fixed um, by the water companies. And for that to take place, a, a kind of a communication line needs to be put in place, but also the right person needs to be informed within the water company and the right engineer needs to go out and investigate to tackle, tackle the problem. And finally, feedback was a really important um, strategy uh, for understanding the impacts of their citizen science activities. And this was feedback not just to the water companies, the environment agency, but also to the citizen scientists themselves. They're all, all really keen to know how, how their work and how their involvement in citizen science has had an impact. So from these workshops, we begin to develop a kind of a detailed understanding of the, the citizen scientists' perspectives and understanding of their impact from their involvement. So we've got a few next steps going forward as this is an ongoing, an ongoing project. Um, and we've actually got some um, a workshop with the Outfall Safari project managers to brainstorm and think about their impacts um, related to the Outfall Safari citizen science project. We're then going to bring both the citizen scientists and the project managers together and think about how they can develop indicators related to the impacts um, they, they've identified as being the most important um, to develop a, an impact and a monitoring and evaluation plan. And a third kind of next step is we're developing um, an online platform where you can measure impact um, and it will produce an indicator score, as I've shown here on the slide. So, just to summarise, citizen science has multiple impacts across multiple different themes. For example, it can impact our environment, our society, um, wider governance, our economy, as well as science and technology. Outfall Safari citizen scientists were most interested in their contribution to environmental and governance impacts and the longer term impacts um, the actions they, they carry out can have. And finally, we've found so far that communication channels are essential for enabling these impacts to be achieved um, and, and to monitor them. Um, so, so that's my talk. So thank you very much for joining. If you'd like to find out more um, about our project, which is ongoing, please get in contact with me or, or have a look on our website. So, so thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Charlotte now. Thank you, Hannah. That was really interesting. Um, Oh, I'll just turn my video back on. There we go. Um, we've got uh, one or two questions coming through specifically for you, but I, I have one just in terms of this sounds like a, a fantastic example of, of how important it is to involve your, your citizen scientists in, in really understanding the, the impact this work can have. Are you aware of other citizen science projects that have, have done anything similar to this? Uh, no, I'm not aware. Well, we've reviewed we've reviewed the literature so far, and there's not uh, many kind of citizen science projects that have looked at the multiple different impacts that citizen science can have. Um, and as part of the the mix project, we're actually um, testing and applying um, this methodology on multiple um, citizen science projects. So we're also uh, doing it with the Riverfly uh, monitoring initiative in the UK. Um, but we've also got case studies across Europe. So we've got uh, one in Hungary, uh, one in Italy, and one in Romania. So we're, we're testing and applying for different types of citizen science projects, um, all different aspects of, of related to water management. Fantastic. That sounds really exciting. Well, um, one question that has come through specifically for you, uh, Hannah, and I think I can... Uh, Oh, let's see if I can find it here, because the problem is I think it might have been upvoted and now I've, I've lost it. Oh, no, there we go. So the question is, when identifying impacts, uh, you asked citizen scientists, did you also ask those in government, governance, enforcement, economic planning and, and so forth? Were, were they consulted as well? Yeah, so that's the next stage of, of the project. So we've actually got a workshop tomorrow with um, the project managers associated with um, Outfall Safari and, and some people from water companies from Thames Water are coming along. So we're going to ask them to brainstorm their impacts as well, and we can compare how they relate to the, the citizen scientists. So that's a really good point, and that's what we are investigating. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, one one more question for you. Um, so... It, this viewer has said, you know, it's really interesting to hear the motivations uh, for project participants and sort of why why they got got involved. Um, but have you managed to to explore? Or do you have any insight into why other people aren't participating in this project in particular, or is that sort of beyond beyond the remit of, of this research? 
That is a really good question. And I, I don't fully know, know the answer. Um, a lot of it is down to time and availability um, to be able to participate in, in these projects. And I think that will be a really interesting um, thing to study. And I actually think um, the next talk, Sarah, might be touching on this as well. So. I think she might be too. So, um, so we will uh, now be joined by uh, Sarah, but we'll we'll come back to hear more from you later on, Hannah. Thank you so much. Um, well, our final speaker this evening uh, is Sarah West, Dr. Sarah West from the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York. The Stockholm Environment Institute is a science to policy research institute where Sarah is director of SEI York. Sarah has been bringing diverse voices into science and decision making for around 12 years, mainly using citizen science approaches. She worked for many years on the OPAL project and together with other SEI colleagues has written reports and journals exploring who participates in citizen science, their motivations for participation and how volunteers can be recruited and retained. Sarah, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Charlotte. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can see my screen. Thumbs up from someone. Um, so I'm Sarah West. I'm from SEI at the University of York. And SEI is a global research organisation focused on, on environmental sustainability. Um, and we have offices in the um, UK, um, York and Oxford, mainland Europe, Stockholm and Tallinn, Thailand, the US and Kenya. We've been working on citizen science projects for over 12 years now, mainly our York, Tallinn, Asia and Africa centres on a whole range of topics. Um, so relating to health and well-being in urban areas and the Chu project, um, which is in Udontali in Thailand and Nakuru in Kenya, um, on biodiversity, so for example, the Opal project, um, parenting on Parenting Science Gang, super yeast, which has been crowdsourcing yeast strains, and um, most recently, ACT Nairobi, which is looking at COVID transmission in an informal settlement in Nairobi. Um, but tonight I'm going to talk about who participates and who is underrepresented in environmental citizen science. And I'm then going to talk about some of the motivations for and barriers against participation, um, some of which um, Hannah's just talked about a little bit. Um, so this presentation draws on work that's done by myself, Rachel Pateman and Alison Dyke, all from SCI York, originally as part of the study for DEFRA in 2015. So we used a market research company to ask 8,220 people in Great Britain if they had ever taken part in citizen science. And this allowed us to reach a really large cross section of the population. Um, so 7% of those who we questioned had taken part in environmental citizen science. Um, and this image just shows some of the key findings. So more men than women had participated. There was high participation for those who are identifying as white and low participation for those identifying as Asian or Black, um, low participation amongst lower socioeconomic groups um, and the unemployed. And we also found um, interactions between variables. So for example, while participation was lowest across both white and minority ethnic groups in 25 to 34 year olds, um, but in white people from older ethnic groups, this increased again, but this upturn was not seen in minority ethnic groups who maintained a low level of participation or dropped in terms of um, the level of participation as they went up the age ranges. There was particularly low rates of participation amongst women from minority ethnic groups. And these findings reflect other studies from Europe and North America, which found that participation is largely biased towards well-educated, more affluent, white, middle and older aged men. However, the majority of citizen science studies provide literally no demographic data or very little demographic data about their participants. So all those who are publishing in this area need to include demographics of who's participating. So we have a much more accurate picture of who participates. So now I'm going to talk about why diversity is important um, and lack of diversity in citizen science is really important both for the data collected, for the participants and for the science and action that results from projects. So for the data collected, um, if there's a correlation between environmental quality and demographics, this could mean that the data collected doesn't give a true picture of the state of the environment. So Kate earlier was talking about bird surveys, and if those surveys are only taking part in a certain part of the country or in certain um, types of houses, for example, you won't get a picture of how that, those species are faring across the state of the environment as a whole. Um, so for example, urban and small gardens tend to be under 
represented in home wildlife recording projects, which could lead to bias here. Um, in other projects, underrepresentation of certain sectors of society could mean that those perspectives or types of local knowledge are not included in those scientific projects and later in decision making. Um, and for those who are not participating, the benefits that can be gained from participation are missed. So, um, for example, gaining knowledge, skills, critical thinking skills, well-being benefits, um, including mental health benefits, forming communities, etc. These will be missed if you're not participating in these projects. And there are also implications for the science generated and the actions that may result from projects. So people and places not represented in the data might be excluded in decision making and therefore not allocated sufficient resources or action take place there. Um, and an aim of citizen science is often to raise awareness of an issue or change behaviour. And that won't be achieved if you're not engaging in those projects or with communities who aren't engaging. Um, and more broadly, working with people can open scientists' eyes to new questions and considerations, potentially creating more relevant and demographic, democratic science. But if certain sectors of society aren't participating, then their priorities will not be considered. And finally, innovation science comes from bringing people together with diversity of experiences and perspectives. And that opportunity will be lost if there isn't diversity in participants. So what we, can we do if we want to recruit more people, more diverse people into environmental citizen science? So this diagram here, which Rachel Pateman and I developed based on a model from Penner, may be useful. So it shows the factors that influence people's decision to participate, their beginning to participate, and then what keeps them participating. And as you can see, an individual's personal attributes, circumstances, and demographic influence all of these stages, as does motivation. Oops, need to go back one, sorry. Um, as does their motivation. So there are things that as project designers or managers, you can't control. Um, like that, so that's the motivations and personal attributes, circumstances, and demographics. But an understanding of how these things can affect positive participation is a first step to overcoming these potential barriers. So let's talk about motivations. Motivations are important to understand in order to recruit people to your project and retain them in projects. So a very widely used and helpful way of categorizing motivations is the volunteer functions inventory from Clary and Snyder, 1999. And they say that motivations generally fall in six categories and Hannah talked about some of these earlier. So understanding motivation is where people want to learn new things. Values is where people have an altruistic concern for others or, other, or the environment. Social motivation is where people are motivated by the desire to meet new people and because volunteering is a socially desirable thing to do. And enhancement motivation is where people want to improve themselves personally through volunteering. Protective motivation is a bit of a slightly um, unintuitive one, I guess, in, but it's actually where people volunteer to reduce negative feelings um, about themselves or to address personal problems that they might be going through. And career motivation is where people hope to benefit to, uh, for their future careers. I mean, in our survey, we found that um, people from different demographic backgrounds had different motivations. For example, people who were holding predominantly values motivations were dominated, dominated by older people from white ethnic groups. People from minority ethnic groups were overrepresented in a cluster of people who held personal development motivations, so enhancement, career and understanding motivations. Now, researchers have found that if you can match motive match volunteers to their initial mot match volunteers initial motivations to their tasks they are more likely to continue volunteering so it's really important to ask volunteers when they do sign up to projects what they hope to gain out of the volunteering experience and so then you can design ways to help meet this so this might be for example ensuring you have space for socializing provide opportunities for learning, sharing knowledge between volunteers or opportunities for people to volunteer with their families, for example. And personal attributes, circumstances and demographics also influence how likely someone is to volunteer. So people with disabilities, for example, are underrepresented in environmental volunteering in the UK. So building in positions that don't require physical activity could be an option for attracting this demographic. And our research suggests that providing and promoting personal development opportunities within projects would be really helpful for reaching underrepresented groups. So this could include clear opportunities to gain knowledge, 
skills or other experiences that would help with career development. So working in a team, taking responsibility for coordinating elements of a project, for example. Um, and the offer of certification, which is used in some citizen science projects, could help attract people who hold these personal development motivations. And then by providing continued learning opportunities and progression through projects, this can help sustain participation in projects and also increase the quality of people's experiences by fulfilling their motivations. Um, so, the, what I want to talk about here is what you can control, which is project organisation and communication. So this is the third main factor that influences participation. So you can influence people's awareness of the opportunity. Research by Sarah Hobbs, who was a former SEI PhD student um, in a socio-economically deprived part of Hull, showed that often people don't participate in environmental monitoring because they just don't know the opportunity exists. And then we, she targeted the advertising to the places where people live and work, so leaflets through doors, on community notice boards, at community events, at faith centres. They can be highly effective for recruiting new participants. And appealing to different motivations in recruitment materials is really sensible. So knowing what motivates existing volunteers from the demographics that you want to attract, whilst bearing in mind that they're highly individual and can change over time, you can then design messaging to attract new volunteers who might hold those same motivations. Um, I also wanted to mention word of mouth. So that's also an important way of recruiting volunteers. But the downside to this is that if volunteers don't have diverse social networks, then the people that they recruit might not be diverse too. Um, so volunteering agencies and educational establishments like schools and universities can be used to broker opportunities, as can community leaders in different groups, so faith leaders, for example, and talking to them about the volunteering opportunity so that they bring in the people that they're working with. Um, creating a relationship of trust and understanding is absolutely critical and really time consuming. So reach out early to organisations you want to work with and be clear about your goals to them. But it's not just about recruitment. Um, so some recent research by Hen Helen Trimble into the differing experiences of white and minority ethnic volunteers in the UK highlighted that recruiting people is not enough. The experience of volunteering and retention rates differs between those two groups of people. Um, so ensuring that there's space for your volunteers to discuss race and racism, that there's a culture of open discussion about any, as any aspects that can turn your volunteers, whether that's race related or the amount of feedback they're getting or recognition or anything else is really important. Um, and Charity So White is a really useful website and Twitter account to follow relating to race in the charity sector. So I just wanted to summarise then, um, the, the things that those of you who are working in the citizen science sector or thinking about working in the citizen science sector, the things that you need to do are to explore and document who's taking part in the projects, discuss with your volunteers what motivates them to take part and what will help them continue, and then use this insight to target underrepresented groups, and then provide ample opportunity for two-way feedback between volunteers and project leaders. Um, so thanks for listening. I can be contacted by my email address, um, which is on my slides, um, or on Twitter, which is Sarah West underscore SEI. Thank you so much, Sarah. Some really interesting insights and advice there as well. Um, we've had lots of questions coming through this evening, and there's certainly some which I think you're going to be able to answer now. And then we'll also um, get the rest of our speakers back as well to, to hear their comments and um, suggestions but one question which um, I'd be really interested to hear your, your answer to um, is, is to do with language um, because somebody has asked whether if we sort of reframe citizen science as community science mm -hmm. might that maybe then enable us to, to involve more, more people in, in this work? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think um, so there's a, that we did a there's an interesting paper called Citizen Science Terminology and defining the key terms. And in that paper, we did do talk about the terminology and community science is something that people use. I think in a sense, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think citizen science is a useful term, um, for example, in the media, the media generally know what citizen science is. Um, but somebody asked me today, I bumped into them when I was walking um, having a snow walk early with my children. She said, what do you do? And I said, I try to involve ordinary people in science. And that was fine. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
bother talking to her about citizen science. So community science is, is a really good term. When I first started at Opal, I was termed a community scientist, and that felt like a bit more of an accessible thing. But citizen science was very much the terminology that was coming from the US, and it's gained so much traction since then. So that's, that's the term that people tend to use in the academic sphere. But I mean, literally just talk to people about what you want them to do. And it's just involving them in your research, right? So call it whatever you want, really. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another question that uh, came through, which perhaps relates to, to what you mentioned, is, is to do with uh, certification. You mentioned that some citizen science projects now do give some kind of cert certificate to sort of demonstrate that someone's um, taken, taken part. Are you aware of sort of any recognised qualification or, or talks about some kind of national um, qualification so that people can use that to perhaps aid in employment opportunities? Yeah, so um, there are lots of courses that you can do around citizen science, actually, and um, some of which offer certification. So I know that UCL run one, Mookie Hackley's group, the Extreme Citizen Science group, they run one, which um, I've got a PhD student who's done recently, and she does absolutely brilliant. Um, so that's one. Um, and I know that um, the Citizen Science Association also run them. Um, and although they don't sort of equate to university credits or something, I imagine that that might be coming. I mean, there's a big, there is a big push um, in the UK from the research councils and citizen science. So it, it might well be on the cards in the future. Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. Well, at this point, we're going to um, turn everyone's cameras back on and uh, bring the rest of our, our speakers back to try and see if we can tackle some of the other questions that have come through this evening, because we've had so many. Thank you so much, um, everyone who's been submitting them. There's still time to, to upvote so that we try and uh, answer the most popular questions before the, the end of the event. Um, but the most popular question at the moment, which I'd, I'd like to open up to, to all of you, is, uh, uh, can you explain more about how you recruit participants for citizen science projects? What has worked and what has not worked? Now, um, Sarah, you've already re reflected on this a bit in, in your talk, but, um, but perhaps from Kate and, and Joe, is there anything you'd like to add as to what you have found has, has worked and has not worked in the, in the past? Wanna go first, Kate? Go ahead. Oh, me? <laughs> Kate, go for it. <laughs> Me, okay. I thought you said I'll go first. Um, yeah, sure. So obviously at the BTO, um, I'll, I'll refer to we when I'm talking about BTO because it's too confusing to try and do otherwise. Um, we've tried lots of different ways to recruit new participants. And, you know, we're really conscious of a lot of the issues that Sarah has been talking about um, in terms of, um, you know, recruiting a diverse range of people to um, take part in surveys um, and we definitely haven't cracked it yet in any way um, but I think really what worked for us in the past hasn't necessarily worked for us doesn't you know might have stopped working in some ways so I think it's actually been quite interesting that um you know, just reaching people through the media and through print um, kind of news in whatever way that might be, whether that's through magazines, whether newspapers, um, kind of used to be the sort of the way we generally broadcast and meet new people. Obviously, um, completely, um, you know, with word of mouth being the sort of the best way really you know people kind of recruiting through um you know meeting somebody who already takes part in surveys mm. um but i would say that's maybe not working as well as it used to do and i think that um obviously you know everything's a lot more digital it's more social media it's web um sort of website advertising those kind of things is where you're reaching people but i would say that from the point of view of maybe the bto um there's a lot more out there now i think it used to be maybe quite easy for us um in that there weren't that many other organizations doing the same thing if you're going back 20 years or so um whereas now it's a very crowded field which is obviously great um for citizen science in general um and i'd say that awareness of citizen science in general is pretty high um but for individual projects i think it's getting harder mm -hmm. um I'm not sure that really answers the question, but it's a, um, a view, a viewpoint. 
I, I think it's very interesting and um, perspective. Thank you, Kate. And and Joe, what about you? Well, I think I mean lots of our projects that um, where we've recruited on a regional scale have largely been about working in accessing community groups, going to visit them on a Friday night in you know a long way away, um, talking to them about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how they might benefit from being involved. So a lot of kind of legwork and accessing the communities that are directly affected by the problems. And then going up from there, all the things that Kate talked about. If you're, Obviously, if you've got a national project, you need national exposure through all the different channels that social media, print media. So, yeah, legwork is the secret for lots of our projects. Yeah, pays off, though. Um, any any other comments on that point before we move on from either you, Sarah, or, or Hannah? Sarah. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, absolutely, legwork is what you need to do. And it's about, like I said, it's about building those trustful relationships with people and speaking to individual people. Um, and it is really time consuming. But if you want to reach people, you need to go to the spaces where they are. So speak to schools, speak to parent teacher associations, speak to faith leaders, put leaflets through people's doors. Those are the things that will reach you new audiences, but it's really time consuming and expensive. People doing that is, it's, you know, if you're paying people to do that, it's expensive. So I think people sometimes see citizen science as a cheap way of gathering data, but it really isn't. No, very good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hannah and and the the rest of you, do you feel free to to chip in? Um, there's a question here that asks: Is there evidence that participants in citizen science develop more pro environmental attitudes? Is is that something that that you saw any evidence of in in your work? Well, I've definitely seen that um, citizen science definitely show a greater understanding of the environment and uh, there's a, an education element um, associated with being involved in these projects and, and for Outfall Safari, um, a lot of them didn't know what a, a misconnection was in plumbing and um, we, we asked them um, for some feedback and a lot of them said after they'd been involved in the Outfall Safari and training, they actually went and checked their houses were plumbed correctly. So, so there is definitely a change in attitude um, as a result of being involved. Um, with the with the scheme and uh, we also have found from some discussions that um, people were more aware of pollution in rivers and so when they saw other people maybe not treating rivers as well they got quite quite angry and were and um, were suggesting all better signage around the river and things would be actually better in in kind of um, teaching the wider the wider society about these issues brilliant that's that's really interesting joe i just want to say i mean i this is all the stuff that i uh I didn't talk about in my opening slides um, because, I mean, I think we've realised through when we first set up our um, eel monitoring project, you know, we were thinking about the data. Oh, we're going to have loads of data from a big area. But actually what, we, what we've learned through this process is that, um, you know, citizen science projects can nurture that um, environmental citizenship. And um, that's incredibly important. Um, through that process, we build capacity to deliver more conservation impact. Absolutely. OK, I'm going to uh, move on to see if we can squeeze in a couple more questions before the end of the event. Um, another popular question that's um, come up uh, is considering that citizen science has been implemented in the UK for, for many years now. Have you had data quality, for example, accuracy critiques from the scientific community as as data is collected by non-specialists? Like, has, has there been sort of any... Um, yeah, any critiques, any criticism from the scientific community in that respect? I can see a few heads nodding. If you want to turn your, your mic on, if you'd like to respond to that, Sarah. Yeah, can I start? Um, yeah, so definitely. And I think um, at first, when I, we first started working on this on the Opal project in 2008, there was definitely scepticism. Um, but I think that we showed through the use of really good training. I know there was a comment in the, um, the, the chat screen about training but really really good training and Kate talked about this too so good training of the volunteers and then good screening of the data and then as Kate also discussed really good statisticians who can actually cut through all the noise and actually find out the results actually um, and then seeing through that we actually produce really good scientific 
um, papers out of that um, has converted some people. And then I think the tide has really turned in the UK in the last, I don't know, two or three years, I really feel like people are now coming to us and saying, hey, I really want to do some more participatory work. I really want to do this citizen science stuff in my scientific research. So I, I really feel like the tide has turned now and people buy into it and know that we as a field have got ways of handling data quality um, issues and um, yeah are really just excited about the fact that they are now being able to work with people and hear more diverse voices and yeah really get a lot out of that kind of participation with people. Mm, so they're really able to see the, the benefits. I think um, so yeah. Would anybody else like to comment on that one? Kate? I mean, I can, yeah, just completely agree with what Sarah has said there. Um, I think from the point of view of the BTO, it's it's always been what we've done. Um, you know, an organisation, you know, that's decades old, um, and that's exactly what we've done all the time. And I think it does need, um, you know, very high-level scientific involvement at whatever stage of the process it needs to be um and you know not and i think if you understand that data better than anyone else you can be very sure about what it's telling you you have to have a really good understanding of what the limitations of the data are so just going an example that sarah um brought up before um about you know garden surveys that are you know based on um anyone can volunteer in their own garden obviously there's going to be a bias in that data set. Um, it's going to be certain people who are taking part in their gardens um, and that's very well understood. And it's obviously very important that you don't try and oversell the data as telling you something that it's not. Um, you know, you can't say this represents gardens as a whole. You have to say, this is what we've learned through these particular gardens, for example. Um, but as long as that you as the user understand the data and you can, and you don't try and put you try, don't try to get it to say things that it doesn't say um then there's no reason for a lack of trust in that way brilliant well um we're coming towards the end of the event so i'm going to pick one final question for you all um which is what are your thoughts on citizen science apps such as iNaturalist and iRecord and perhaps this feels particularly relevant at the moment because there have been other questions about the impact of, of COVID-19 on citizen scientist projects many of which often involve actually going out in into nature so does anyone have any final thoughts on on the role of sort of digital um uh uh projects such, such as as those are, are they something that that work well I I think we've really, really benefited from, from new ways of being able to communicate amongst a community of people that develop around a citizen science project. So we've helped, we, we've benefited from that perspective. What sometimes is a bit of an issue with apps is the, is, the, is the multitude of them, and you're never quite sure, the fractionation, I suppose, of, of the field. Um, and you know, you know, you're never quite sure which is the one that you should use for re recording. And so we do need to sort of work together to better clarify. When I say that, I'm talking about the environmental conservation organisations. You know, um, we need to work together to better clarify the best routes for data sharing, and data storage. Absolutely. Yes, Sarah. Yeah, um, totally. And the other thing I would say is um, also think about who isn't participating or isn't able to participate through those apps, the same as, as what Kate was just discussing with the with the bird survey. So there will be some people who just can't, who can't use those apps um, because they don't have a smartphone or don't have enough um, internet connection or whatever. Um, so that's important to bear in mind. Um, and then the other thing to bear in mind is that you can just make an you can make an app lots of people i can't make an app but lots of people can make an app but you can't just make an app and expect people to come again it takes a lot of kind of engagement behind the scenes to get people to contribute to your app and then get feedback from it you know if, if you take part and you put some data up on iNaturalist or whatever or iRecord and you don't hear anything back for nine months and then finally you get someone saying thank you for your record of a dandelion I'm probably not going to take part again. So, you know, you do need to have some people at the other end or some automated systems at the other end thanking people for what they've done 
and um, explaining what, what you're doing with that information. Otherwise they won't keep coming back. So there are, there's great things about them, but you do also need to think about who isn't involved and how you can keep people involved in it once they've started. Yep, just like all of those in-person citizen science projects as well. Well, um, on that note, I'm afraid we are going to have to uh, draw to a close this evening's event. Thank you so much for, for all of your questions and comments that you've submitted this evening. It's been great to have so many of you involved. And thank you, of course, to all of our speakers this evening too for fantastic talks. We really appreciate it. And thank you too to my colleague, Ellie, who's been behind the scenes and Tendai, ensuring that everything has, has run smoothly tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you one last time because at the beginning of tonight's event, I mentioned that we really want your feedback. We want to know what you thought of tonight's event. Um, so please do let us know. You can use the QR code that's on the screen now, or you can go to surveymonkey.com forward slash our forward SL event five to let us know what you thought of tonight's event. It's quite a short survey. It shouldn't take long, just um, a few minutes, but it will help us in planning future events. Speaking of which, if you'd like to see what we've got coming up over the next few months, then do go to our website, zsl.org forward slash science events, where you'll be able to find out more about our next evening event, which is next week uh, on Monday, all about island conservation followed in March by Return to the Wild, How Can We Recover Extinct in the Wild Species? And if you're still looking for a science and conservation fix, then join us on Wednesday lunchtimes fortnightly for Wild Lunch Wednesdays, where we'll be speaking to some of our ZSL scientists and conservationists about their fieldwork experiences. And to make sure that you don't miss any of this in the future, all you need to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel. So press that subscribe subscribe button now and uh, you never need miss another event and finally of course on our website there is further information about how you can donate and support to our work um, how you can get involved perhaps become a ZSL fellow or even take part in some of our very own citizen science projects that Joe mentioned earlier but for now thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a very good evening bye <laughs>